Hello and welcome to the second year of the Festival of Discovery. Have we got some treats for you? And the best treat, which you're about to see in a minute, is a conversation between myself, Sir David Attenborough, who you all know, and if you don't, shame on you, and Edward O. Wilson, Professor Edward O. Wilson from Harvard, probably the greatest ecologist the world has ever seen. You will see here a very interesting juxtaposition between, if you like, ivory towered holding on to the values of academia and Sir David's slightly impatient, now is the moment we've got to seize the day. I have a feeling that I know where our sympathies lie, but what a fascinating essay in how the arguments break down in the world. So enjoy it, think about it, and uh, tell us what you think. It would seem that the obvious first question on a night that has been postponed for two years um, by a virus, uh, it would be quite an obvious thing to say, do we think that the pandemic has changed global perceptions of the natural world and the fragility of the human condition and conceit of national boundaries and such things? I think that it has given us a global view which is absolutely essential if we're going to deal with these global problems. The world is, the human population is amazingly varied. We are terribly blinkered in our own communities. We don't think about China, the expanses of China, the vast number of people, China, India, Africa, but apart from even, even those disparate civilizations, we tend all the time to think about ourselves. Um, and this crisis has made us think about other people. And to that extent, it's, it's greatly to be welcomed because we will only deal with global um, issues if the people of the world at large agree so to do. Uh, I would like to believe that the technology, the medium, which I've been involved in all my life for 70 years, has helped in that because the films of these extraordinary creatures with which we share the world are now seen by everybody all over the world. And not only that, but you can get a reaction to them immediately. And there is a sense of community, a global community, which is building now, which certainly wasn't there 70 years ago. It certainly wasn't there 50 years ago. In fact, it has just arrived. And I hope and hope beyond hope that when we go to the COP26 meetings, that the people who represent us will be happy to believe that they can take a global view and that the people they represent want them to take a global view. And that has been supported uh, by COVID because we real, we're all in the same boat. And the, so it's not just an epidemic, it is a crisis that is worldwide and we're all together. So to that extent, I'm sure that we, that the faces with, the, with this terrible epidemic has brought us all together and will give us a united voice. Our chance of doing that greater than ever. Thank you for that, that's very, very good to hear. This last week, His Royal Highness uh, made some comments which echo those of many other people about it being a pity that so much attention was being given by so many smart people to taking technology into space when if similar attentions were, or similar level of attentions were being put on Earth, we might be able to solve some of our problems a lot more quickly. How do you feel about such an assertion? Well, I have to, I have to say I have no uh, ambition to go into space. <laughs> uh, I, uh, what will I see? 
I would go to, go to sleep for a long time, float around for a long time, and I won't see a butterfly. Uh, I'd rather have a butterfly. I think that's a perfect answer. A perfect answer. Thank you. Now, Ed, welcome to Britain. Can you hear us? I can. Loud and clear. I, uh, I, I take it that that is uh, uh, that uh, that recognizes what I've just said, yeah, yeah. and that uh, that uh, it's not uh, for recognition of the ever-growing shortness of my being there. No, well, okay. no, obviously, it is the, the the beam of your charisma coming from across the pond. So we're delighted oh. to see you. Um, David was just reflecting on the pandemic, and uh, the question was, uh, do you believe that, let us take it as an American viewpoint, that the pandemic has changed world views, uh, at least through the American eyes, of the interconnectedness of all things across the planet? We certainly have changed our views, uh, but not in a way that is uh, deeply relevant to the subject of biodiversity uh, and a crisis which in the long term for the uh, future of the history of humankind, uh, it is not as uh, important as the subject that we are attempting here to uh, characterize and suggest solutions for. In your book, Half Earth, and in many of the talks today about Half Earth, there is an underlying sense that survival of things, they, they need to be named. Um, I know that sounds a very, uh, 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 that is a simplistic uh, uh, reference, I know. But is it, in your opinion, one of the great priorities for us to put in a, mo a monster effort to, if you like, taxonomically uh, discover what is on Earth so that we might name it and therefore care more for it? It is of immense consequence. We'll come out of this um, disease, the viral disease, I think, uh, we're in a way that will be uh, regarded as just a flick on a, uh, on a movie screen, uh, but we will never come out uh, from under the sloth of species that we've been carelessly uh, allowing to happen just by our ordinary everyday activities. Um, extinction is forever. And um, we need to spend a great deal more time on the double challenges of evolutionary biology that is uh, the most important of all, I believe. First, what is it and where is it precisely? And what is the condition of it for each species in turn? Uh, and uh, then uh, what can we do without making kind of a, a revolutionary change in our uh, behavior uh, serve uh, to save as many species and allow them to go on into whatever future uh, humanity has as the key member of that ensemble. David, would you, how do you feel about that? Taxonomy is the basis of our science. If we don't know what we're talking about, uh, how can you be precise on your deductions? On the other hand, Taxonomy, as we're going, as we've been dealing with it, as has uh, just been said, uh, since the 19th century. But we don't have decades. No. We have to take action right now. And we have to persuade people all over the world to do things in their private lives and change their lives if we're to solve these problems. So while, of course, taxonomy is crucially important, um, th 
the important thing now is to convince everybody that they can take action in their own lives and they wish their politicians to act on their behalf as well. Those are the issues that at the moment, and they're, they're urgent right now. We were talking earlier about um, clear and present danger and the human inability to think long term or to have the Im imagination of what can happen to it. I get the tone from what you say that you feel that maybe, well, I hope I'm not putting words into your mouth, that maybe the clear and present danger we need in which to kick us into addressing it is just about with us. Do you feel that that is the case? Yes, yes. It, it, it is really very urgent, this. We can't go on saying, yes, in another 10 years' time we'll take action. We have to take action right now. I mean, the time goes by, days go by, months go by, years go by, um, and we don't, we don't move. It, it, it's taken us a long time to start shifting. I believe that there's a momentum building mm -hmm. right now. Yep. And I believe that the people worldwide will be thinking and looking at Glasgow and saying, do something. And do something, please, that is not selfish that is not nationalistic, but which is global. Look at the health of the globe. We all, people up there have different uh, electorates behind them on their tails, as it were. But you have to want, we deal with, uh, uh, take a global view, because if we don't, we're sunk. What's the view from America? What will we do? Uh, when we find ourselves on a planet mostly exhausted from its original fauna and flora uh, and dependent entirely of, on, its, uh, on our, um, on our um, ingenuity and energy to stay alive, it'll be a lot easier to, to stay alive and to improve humanity uh, if we now re-inaugurate taxonomy, uh, discover the species on Earth, name them, find out what they're doing, and learn what it will take to keep them and the um, e ecosystem, the collection of species living together, uh, what, what it will take for the, all of that uh, to remain and survive uh, the first great human onslaught on Earth's uh, biodiversity underway right now. Ed, thank you. I, I, I would like to share with you a, an incredibly cruel observation, and I do this in friendship, of course. Um, thanks to Matthew Shubman and the MIT research, it shows that in 1850, 25% awareness of famous scientists of the day across the so-called civilized world. Today, less than 1%. What is science doing wrong? I don't mean, I, I'm, this isn't a jibe. What, the, 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 we've got 50% recognition of top sports people, people who've been on desert islands, people who've dated other people. Uh, <laughs> And yet we've got a, so basically there's a culture war going on that you want a, te, a, a taxonomic renaissance as in fact probably do all of us. But David's point is we haven't got time. It's a bit like Nero fiddling while Rome burns if actually over a very short period of time we need to get certain things started. So I'm gonna ask David in terms of the brutality of the emergency that we think we are probably facing, what do you think structurally needs to change in our society to, in order to enact action? I don't know. Um, we, have to, we have to give power, strength to our representatives. Um, but what, what alarms me most is that uh, if you ask why are certain decisions not being taken, a lot of people say, oh, well, it's a different nation. It's got this view or that view or the, the laws and one thing or another. But take a, take a very simple example. We depend upon the sea 
uh, for our food, and increasingly so for our food and for our health. The sea is free of legal restrictions for much of its surface. It's uh, an international commons. There's an empty area which is as, as free of, of difficulties as any part of the land of this globe will be. We cannot at the moment agree to a policy to deal, to rule our fisheries, which we know are destroying the ocean. We can't even depend on that. That's what alarms me. Um, that we, issues of nationalism uh, are, are irrelevant on the sea. Uh, and that enormous problem that face could easily be solved if we actually backed our representatives at an issue like COP. I, I just hope that that's, that's just a simple example. I mean, that's the easiest example that I can think of that would produce immediate effect. Will it happen? I hope and pray it will. I believe that that's correct. And thank you very much for bringing it dead center. Key uh, for the uh, continuous life of most of the species on Earth and the uh, contingent nature of humanity uh, in living on Earth uh, and uh, surviving, perhaps even surviving as a species in itself, uh, is a deep understanding of what lives around us, what is uh, the biodiversity, uh, what can go on without us or that we can fall back on for uh, information and for um, plants and, and domestic animals uh, to uh, feed and service. And we have only fragmentary uh, knowledge when we recognize too that any contact between these species, wild species, from uh, ecosystems not known uh, or uh, managed in a productive manner uh, could be uh, deadly important uh, in um, damaging the human economy uh, still more. We, there are organisms out there and species we have not yet discovered uh, that can uh, harm us terribly. And species out there also that we uh, may not have even discovered yet um, that could provide our salvation in, few, in future um, endeavors and, and expansion uh, and uh, population increase. Uh, we need to know what it is that's living around us. We're all hoping that we've got a bit more time so that we can adjust ourselves, but we've got to go real fast. I, I agree completely with David. I, 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 I love where you want to go, but I do wonder whether we're actually at a time where we're going to be found wanting because we don't recognize the urgency of it. So I'm going to... I just want to throw that at you, and I'll come back to you to answer on that, because I've got a question of completely unparalleled triviality to ask you after these serious questions, um, which is you've identified 455 varieties of ant, which is not trivial. It's astonishing, absolutely astonishing. But I really need to know, I really need to know how... Um, you managed to name an ant after Indiana Jones. <laughs> uh, I uh, went to um, work about four years ago, um, determined to um, make a working map of one genus, that's a, sim a group of species together that are especially abundant in the New World, new, uh, in um, North America, South America. And um, uh, so I went through a, a huge quantity of specimens that had been prepared for this kind of examination to see every part of their external anatomy, the gland openings, 
uh, the exact number of segments on the antennae, the, the, uh, uh, the feelers, uh, the structure of the mandibles and so on. You master all of that and out fall a uh, species you've never seen before in uh, by scientists. Uh, and um, that happened to me as I expected it to. And uh, I uh, think it was 178 species I found that were new to science. I ran out of names. I had so many new species of names. Uh, I, uh, I turned in desperation. And one of the species, I uh, two uh, uh, people famous in other spheres, and one of the uh, uh, species that I described has the technical name of Phydoli. That's, that's the uh, genus of all these species put together. Uh, Phydoli Harrison Fordi. Brilliant. I know, I think it was about the coolest thing I've seen. You know, you know, I walked in with Sebastian to Buckingham Palace, and you walk in with Harrison Ford. I mean, you know. But I do have to tell you something um, which will be very disappointing to you. Um, you have discovered, you know, all of those new species, but you've only got two named after you. He hasn't discovered any bloody species, and he's got 17 <laughs> named after him. And, 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 yeah. And one that died 100 million years ago. I mean, that's, that's class, isn't it? No, no. I'm, 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 I'm joking, I'm joking, Ed. I mean, it is, it is so astonishing. Seriously, um, I want to bring the evening to an end because I think it's, well, I don't want to bring it to an end. It's just that, you know, we're getting old. Um, and it is a fascinating essay or a conversation to hear the, if you like, down deep and dirty of um, science in the raw, building up the taxonomic picture of ecosystems, which we all know that systems are really, really big. And then talking to David about the urgency of the moment and the importance of COP and the, the being a momentum. And I, I can't help feeling that I want you there still for when we've actually got to a position where everybody feels confident to find out what's left on the planet. I would really like to end by perhaps asking David to reflect in terms of climate change, in terms of the leaders you have met, the feeling of momentum you feel is there now, which I think many in the audience agree with you. Out of 10, what is your degree of hope? Oh, hope. Out of 10, what is your degree of expectation? Oh, hope, of course, is obviously, go for, I'll go for the 10, thank you very much. Excellent. I hope for everything, why wouldn't one? How much will you achieve? I think it would be lucky if we get about 50 or 60, honestly. Um, I, mean, I really mean lucky. Uh, th and then we've got a chance. If we get nothing but hot air, and indeed, you know, it's, it, it, the cops all very well, but it's just people talking. Um, we had enough from Paris years ago of talking and agreeing, but what happened? Not enough by a very long way. As you started by saying this evening, uh, the virus has brought us together. Let us stay together. Let us stay shoulder together and recognize that we, the people of the world, are facing a major issue that we can solve if we just put aside national interests and realize that nationalism is yesterday. International has to be tomorrow. Bloody right. I... Ed, as our wraith coming across the pond into our space here at the Geographical Society, it is only hostly for us to give you the last one minute. What a privilege it's been to have you. If you'd like to have just one minute to say what you hope for from the coming period, let's not call it COP, but the next period, are you hopeful? Uh, oh yes, this is one of the most easily soluble problems in human activity. 
It's just that we haven't gotten around to educating uh, the uh, and doing the research needed uh, to show uh, how important and interesting biodiversity is. And by biodiversity, I don't know, I don't mean exclusively the big mammals and, and reptiles uh, and uh, fish and so on that uh, are the uh, faunas of, uh, in the imagination of most people. I mean everything, all including the, uh, the insects and other small invertebrates, uh, most of which are all, uh, to the large part, um, unstudied. And I would then take uh, these attractions, the ability to do real science, and start it immediately. I'd take it to our young people, uh, even down to the, uh, to, to the grammar school level, and show them with field trips and with the discovery of new species and with the talkings in class about natural history that if they want to go into science, if they want to be a success uh, in the main uh, activities of scientific research and teaching, uh, this is the way to do it. Thank you very much. Can we give a big English hand to Ed Wilson? incredibly inspired. I loved the contrast actually between what both of them are saying. You know, um, obviously David's uh, immediate emergency now with COP coming up, the passion from all of his historic, you know, the whole of his life is kind of culminating in this moment. And Edward's view too was in contrast, you know, it's actually, we still mustn't lose sight of the future and actually inspiring young people to want to get, to care enough about the biodiversity. Like them, I'm watching COP26 and wanting to see what's going to come out of that, whether there's going to actually be significant action. As Sir David said, we've been here before and now really is the time to actually do something different. It's not just about what the politicians and the leaders at COP say, it's going to be about what that means for people and what they do in their day-to-day -day lives. And I think one of the really interesting things that I picked up on from David's perspective was this leaving the nationalism behind and thinking internationally. And I think the pandemic absolutely has made people think in a different way. We're all in the process of transition now. And, um, and I think the pandemic has had some, uh, I think it has brought people into into a sort of into a shared space and that maybe hopefully we can take that shared space and make it good the corporate world's got a huge role to play i think while it may seem that there's an incompatibility between the world of nature and the environment and biodiversity and business i actually think you kind of need the two to work in tandem to make it happen there needs to be more pressure on what's happening invisibly in the world of money markets and what's happening in the world of economics and if we can sort of start to put some of those pressure levers on what's happening in that space, then I think that's going to, you know, fundamentally help what we're trying to achieve here. But I don't think I don't think we're in a position to be able to separate the two. I think that quite easily. I felt the energy and the excitement, and I guess the imperative. I, interestingly, to think about how, as a country and a community, we can get behind our politicians and our policy makers in the run-up to COP26. So the final words of David around uh, national as being a thing of the past and international as a thing of the future and how as we as a country need to really think globally and take the opportunity of coming together as a global community. My thing is more about species loss and habitat loss which obviously has uh, an impact from the climate as well, but it's very much cutting down the trees, the orangutan habitat, all of that stuff, I find really, really depressing in a massive way. And so I don't feel any different from when I walked in, other than it just makes, it sort of harnesses the need to really do something now internationally. One is too small to make a difference, that's the key thing. I, it's very well known that global climate change is a significant problem now for us. 
it's a wicked problem. No one really is knowing exactly what they can do as individuals. So the, there is a lot of pressure on the bigger players, the politicians, the nation states, to make very big, uh, very big commitments. But the individuals need to play a big part in that. They need to give the mandate to the politicians and show that they care through their individual actions and also through voicing what their concerns are. The general whole climate thing absolutely terrifies me and I find it very depressing. We were, we were talking about it, about the fact that it has to be international. Absolutely, totally, 100%. And, you know, just there's so much going on that we're just not doing. Recycling and just everything, it just scares the life out of me. It's looking at your plastic usage in your house. It could be something as simple as turning your heating down by one degree. It, it doesn't even have to be that much. And I know I've had these conversations even with my own family where they sort of say, well, well you know, what's the point unless it's the collective? It's not going to make any difference. But my answer back to them is if we all said that, absolutely nothing would change. And it's, you know, don't be frightened, but also don't put too much pressure on yourself by thinking you're not good enough and not doing enough. Because something is always better than nothing. It's about being aware, it's about being smart, it's about being informed. It's about making the changes you can make. It's about being thoughtful and mindful. Um, I also, I also don't think that we can wait for someone else to do the change for us. I think there's a lot of, yes, the governments have to make a change, but they have an extremely complex mechanism and structure in which they have to navigate. So we can always wait for someone else to do the doing, but at the end of the day, I think it's it's up to us individually to work out what's our contribution to the you know the greater good.